I'm going to introduce a speaker now who is <clears throat> a game and play researcher. Um, he's uh, has he's been to 19 kintos. <coughs> he's a brilliant analyst and a great writer and a great speaker. And the last time I met him, he played my old father in a destructive and incestuous relationship. <laughs> Yeah, he's the guy who defined Rory Clark, you know, a few years ago. Or not. <laughs> I give you Yaku Senos. Good morning, everyone. Four years ago, the last time Knutpunkt was in Norway, I gave a talk on the definition of Nordic art. At the time, I argued that Nordic lab cannot be defined by geography or form, uh, but it is more useful to approach it as an art tradition and a movement comprised of LARPs that are created in relation to earlier LARPs in the tradition and the discussion around these LARPs. Uh, the definition I put forward has been criticized, <laughs> to put it mildly, but I do still stand by it. I still think that approaching Nordic LARP as a movement is the best way to uh, attempt to grasp it. Not all LARP is art, nor does it need to be, yet thinking about LARP through that lens as movements is useful. However, as I stated in 2013, the definition was not the universal one, but reflected at that moment in time. The definition had an explicit best before date, and it has passed. <laughs> The organizers of this Knutpunkt asked me to uh, revisit the definition in this keynote. I'm not really going to do that, though. <laughs> As with all interesting movements, things change, the discourse shifts, and meaning moves. The label Nordic LARP is not as useful as it was four years ago. Perhaps some of us thought that Nordic LARP was finished, the final form, so to speak. But of course, that is not true. We are not done evolving. Just as cubism has stopped being the thing to do in painting at a certain point, Nordic LARP is no longer that useful as a label. We have all kinds of interesting movements happening here in the Nordics and around the world. Uh, LARP is a form of expression, ju and just as painting has had impressionism, cubism, pointillism, uh, LARP has had things like Boffer LARP, Mindside Theatre, and Nordic LARP. However, if an art movement lasts for more than a decade, then it is very likely dead on its feet, or, you know, popular entertainment. <laughs> Indeed, Nordic LARP is not very exciting. Instead, we are excited about other things. Uh, we talk about black box LARPs, and even more specifically, Nina form. <laughs> a few years ago, castle LARPs appeared, and even that tradition has crossed oceans and evolved to the point where castles are not, strictly speaking, necessary. <laughs> There are things like uh, the Southern Way, the new Italian LARP. And then there is the new vampire LARP as well, or as it is pronounced in original Swedish, new vampyr. <laughs> Indeed, we seem to have a lot of new going around. I'm not really ready to declare Nordic LARP dead. But as a label, it is not particularly useful when thinking about the present and certainly not when designing the future. However, as a term referring to a historical moment, one that has all but, but passed, it is practical. I will not try to make sense of all of these new, new movements. Uh, it strikes me as too early to do that yet. We are currently in a state of flux. Trying to find one umbrella under which we all fit comfortably seems even futile at this moment. Even the umbrella of the word LARP seems somehow limiting. There is a renaissance of LARP going on. Interesting things are happening in relation to form and content, and especially community. I feel that we are embarking on a second boom uh, of manifestos. Uh, the first one started 18 years ago in the Nordics, when we were just starting to realize that not everybody LARPed the same way as we did in that small community, and obviously our way of LARPing was the best. Now, again, people are starting to issue demands as to what LARP should be like, although those demands are more related currently to the communities of LARP, such as calling for a better content culture uh, in game mechanics 
accessibility in LARPs, addressing broken stairs in the community, and so on. Also, due to the professionalization of LARP, we are talking about labor and various currencies of cred and pep, as well as the cultural capitals used to pay for such things. And then, of course, there are the traditional manifesto manifestos, like the one Chaos League issued last <coughs> April. As LARP is being pushed into new areas, appropriated by artists and teachers and subjected to capitalist logic, we again need to look at the form. Where is the heart of LARP? We will have different answers to this, and this will birth different movements. This is a great time to issue demands. The wonderful thing about manifestos is that they can be idealistic and they can be unreasonable. So in the spirit of midwifing the future, uh, I'm going to share my claim. Recently there was a discussion online about whether LARPs are, by their very nature, emancipatory. Do LARPs always empower the, emp the participants? Do they teach you empathy, how to see things from another's point of view? While I think LARP has this potential, the form also has some built-in booby traps. I will explore one of those booby traps today. I claim that NPCs are dehumanizing. Having groups of people represented as adversaries, servants, obstacles or symbols with a set function and a fixed narrative without proper agency is dehumanizing. Non-player characters, even when inhabited by players, are less than human. They are props and toys for the player characters to do as they please. I realized this last fall when I was watching the re recent HBO television series Westworld. Westworld, if you haven't watched it, it's a sci-fi show about a future where there is a LARP-like amusement park where you can go and role-play being in, the, in an American Western. The park is populated by androids, very human-like robots that the players, or guests as they are called, kill and have sex with. The robots are less than humans. They are things. They are playthings. Those of you who are a little bit older may remember Holodeck from Star Trek. It has the exact same dehumanizing effect. We recognize these robots as NPCs. Playing with an NPC doesn't matter as much. If only an NPC sees you die, do you really die? <laughs> if an NPC dies in the forest, does anyone care? <laughs> obviously, when we, obviously, when we have NPCs in our LARPs, they are played by people, so the limits are a little bit different. But there is a continuum. Uh, at one end, we have LARPs like In Residency and White Death, where each character is a player character with pretty much the same agency. At the other end, we have Westworld, where there is a clear distinction between players and people as props. In the middle, we have most LARPs. Uh, that have some instructed characters or NPCs. Sometimes they are player characters that have some task that they just need to take care of for the LARP to function. Uh, LARPs that have hierarchies usually have these kinds of things. For example, Mr. T in Just the Loving and the Brass in Monitor Celestra. Then there are the characters that have numerous tasks, tasks like the professors at College of Wizardry uh, or, or Hamlet and Ophelia in Inside Hamlet. Then we have the labs that have groups of people, usually adversaries, that are more like functions than people, like the monsters in Dystopia Rising and the interrogators in Capo. We don't have the same respect for NPCs as we have for the other characters. They are less than human. Sometimes we even expand this to the players of the NPC, for example, when we forget to design proper de-rolling and aftercare for the NPC players. Indeed, we don't think about their LARP experience. Some of them only exist to be killed, and they are there to support your experience as a player character. This is the amusement park approach to LARP. These LARPs are only about your experience, not about everyone's experience. This is othering. This is akin to colonialism. This is your PC privilege. Of course, role-playing has also a long and tangled history with fantasy literature. And fantasy literature is filled with racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and dehumanizing. 
Roleplay is often about power fantasies, getting to do the things you want to do, sometimes on the expense of others. And in this political moment, uh, where fortress Europe is leaving refugees to die, where popular fascist movements are targeting minorities, and where globalization and robotization are fueling unemployment, and then the unemployed are uh, portrayed as lazy leeches, these, there is a lot of dehumanization going on. I think it is important to be aware that, to some extent, we are reproducing these structures and ideas in our lives. And to some extent, of course, we are aware of this. Some years ago, well, maybe 20 years ago, <laughs> we used to talk about the LARP democracy effect, where on Friday we have a feudal hierarchical fi uh, fantasy village, but by Sunday democracy has taken over and there are elections for the village council. <laughs> this makes sense if everyone is recognized as fully human, with full human rights. Of course, this is partly because our fictional world reflects our main world and the player's values. Since then, we have developed a taste for dystopian LARPs that have terrible hierarchies, and we, we don't get LARP democracy as often. But we have a version of it still. I call it werewolf pride. If you introduce a monstrous werewolf as player character into your LARP, you are also introducing the concept of werewolves as fully human beings. Monster characters with full agency easily trigger werewolf pride. This is basically the Chekhov's gun of werewolves. <laughs> Again, uh, there is a reflection of our out-of-LARP values. When we have agency, we tend towards equality and inclusion. However, this only works if everyone has full agency. Indeed, maybe because we think of ourselves as good, inclusive people, we feel that we can do whatever we want to the NPCs. It is not real, after all. Nonetheless, we are reproducing the idea that not everyone is human. At the same time, it is true that NPCs are a great tool for LARP design. They enable us to concentrate the design and leave stuff out. Maybe you are not interested in setting up the orc culture. Maybe you need the captain of the ship to respond in a specific way for the situation that you want to explore in the LARP to even come about. Indeed, if we think about LARPs as simulations, then you must make choices. A simulation is always a reduction. It reduces fidelity. It does not and cannot reproduce the world one for one. However, when you make choices, the choices have intended and unintended consequences. And when you reduce someone to a prop, you rob them of their humanity. For example, in Halat Hisar, the oppressors were dehumanized NPCs. But this was a conscious design choice. Yet, it is also the one thing that Halat Hisar has mostly been criticized for. To be clear, I am not saying that using NPCs in a LARP is bad. Nor am I saying that designers who use NPCs are somehow evil. That would be silly. The point I am trying to make is that forms and methods and models we use are not neutral. They have consequences we should be aware of and maybe take advantage of when we are designing. With this example claim, this claim that I'm making, that NPCs are dehumanizing, I want to underline that just as Nordic LARP was not the final form, whatever it is that where we are now is not that either. We are not yet fully evolved. I hope that we will never be fully evolved. There are still interesting questions to ponder and address in LARP. And not all of the, those questions relate to community design, even though that is the hot topic today. But there are still unexplored areas in the form itself. To those of us, and I think there are many in this room today, who are excited about developing the form and finding new areas, I say, we are not done. The future of LARP looks exciting. So design away. Thank you.